All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna give it another minute or two and then we will officially start. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We like to kind of get to know the coaches that are here live with us, ask um, questions in the QA feature. Um, you can talk about in the chat, like, are you a beginning coach? Um, are you an expert? If you're an expert, this might not be the webinar for you, but we're glad you're here. Cool. All right, I'm gonna get us started. So welcome to our coach chat about building team mentality featuring oh, Rob Marmorstein. Did I say it? So close, so close. Um, so yeah, I'm Melanie. I help run most of these coach chats. I'm the Play Versus Community Coordinator. And today, like I said, we'll be discussing building a team mentality with your players. We will have a QA session at the end. Occasionally I will stop and ask questions that make sense at that moment. So please submit your questions using the QA feature. You can use the chat to say hello to us or give any like stories or information about you or your program. Um, so a quick introduction, Rob is the head coach and creator of Clifton High School Esports. He has brought on two assistant coaches to help him in games that they are more familiar with, League of Legends and Overwatch, while he oversees the rest of the games played for his program. The League of Legends teams team has made the semifinals in the playoffs for two seasons, and one of his Fortnite teams became the fall season NA East champions. Rob is also a special education inclusion teacher at his school and many of his students take part in the competitive side of the club, as well as part of the club um, that just meets to hold tournaments. So thank you, Rob, for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time. Of course, my pleasure to be here. Hi, folks. Who are the three of you that are here? <laughs> we will be recording this. Um, it's being recorded now and I send it out usually within 24 to 48 hours after the coach chat. So today we'll be doing, um, I already did the introduction, but we'll look at building community, identifying some behaviors, um, and what to do about those, turning, and then turning individuals into a team. And then again, we have the QA. All right, I'm gonna turn it over officially to Rob and mute myself. So the one thing that I thought was really, really important about building a program to build a community was that you had to build hype around the program. So the thing that I did was initially I was just holding Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Tournaments uh, every month. I would hold the tournament. It started off with 20 kids showing up and uh, eventually it went, down the it went down the road where I had to limit it because I got up to like 60 to 70 and it went on for three hours at a time. So uh, I, I built hype around that I got a lot of the gamer kids within my school of which my school is enormous anyway. I got a lot of them uh, interested in the idea that, you know, there was going to be a, an esports or a gaming club that was going to be uh, part of part of the, uh, the the chs uh culture so i oops spotlight it for everybody. uh the other thing that i did once i established that this was going to happen was i divided them up into teams i figured out what teams were relevant and i went with play versus uh as opposed to some of their competitors which uh had less than savory reviews and weren't nearly as uh cooperative and i essentially announced to the student body which games we had or which games we were going to offer. Students came in, filed in. Originally, I only had League of Legends, but since then I've kind of built that out a lot. Uh, so after all that, post all that, building the community within the, within, uh, the, the, the teams was, I brought a positivity, uplifting language when addressing the teammates and coaches. And uh, that's super important because as you probably already know, gamers are really, really toxic and if you were a gamer or are a gamer, you, especially when you were a teenager, you know that you say things and uh, they're not always good things. And you can probably look back and regret a lot of what you said. And that, that, that is what it is. You learn, you grow. So uh, I had to instill in them that the level of toxicity, especially around their teammates, was absolutely not going to be tolerated. And to, uh, to use, you know, promote positivity, use uplifting language, just use language that would 
uh, instill hope or any kind of faith in your players and in the coaching staff in those players so that everyone succeeds together. Uh, being hard on players at the right time and using those instances to promote teachable moments that the, uh, that the players can easily access. So that just comes from my, uh, my basic philosophy with educating as well, which, uh, you know, partially comes from a lot of teachers I had growing up and uh, my football coach back in high school, which is being really hard on people is more often than not the right thing to do, especially if you notice that that works for them. Uh, when I'm really hard on my players, it's because I, I know that that person is going to respond to it in the most effective way, that that person is going to rally, uh, rally around the fact that uh, I'm going to show him and they're going to they're going to elevate themselves to where I want them to be. And I use that afterwards. Never let any teachable moment ever escape you. So when you're hard on the kids, make sure that the thing that you were hard on them about becomes a teachable moment. Why this was a growing experience and not just mean for the sake of being mean. Uh, establishing a fair system of punishments and players who do not buy into the culture of the program. So that's what, like what I said there before, being toxic to teammates. So the fair system of punishment is entirely, obviously, up to you guys. Uh, I've enacted uh, bans and suspensions, depending on the severity of the infraction for the, uh, for the players. Uh, kids, just like, in, just like in education, kids want to know where the line in the sand is. They crave structure. They want to know the rules. They may act you know, like they don't, or they might rebel a little bit, but that's entirely based around the idea that they don't know where the line in the sand is drawn. When you show them where that line in the sand is drawn, they might tow it, but that's where the being really harsh to them, showing them a teachable moment comes in. So I establish a fair system of punishment, depending on the severity. I had one student, as a, for instance, I had one student who was, I'm going to say he was jealous of another student's starting position in the league team. So his friends had taken to messaging that student privately on social media to harass him, to leave his starting role so that their friend could start. I suspended that kid for two weeks. Uh, and when he came back, I revoked his captain status. And then I gave him, uh, I, I demoted his role until he was able to prove to me that that's not who he was. And he did, and it worked out. But uh, it's everything is entirely based on what you think is right for your students or your players. And I have mine. Oh, and team meetings. Team meetings are huge. Uh, I meet with my players, all my players, all of my teams. Um, some of them don't, depending on students that work. But on average, most of my teams play uh, practice for at least one hour a day, Monday to Thursday. And that includes competition day. One of my teams even practices upwards of five to six times a week because a lot of them just want to be in. So Overwatch, uh, for, uh, Fortnite, League, Smash, they're all around the clock. And I have a schedule so that basically my day ends right now at uh, 11.48. I get home. I have uh, 1.35 to 2.35 office hours. I go from 2.35 to about 8 o'clock at night in different voice chat servers, uh, making sure that my students are talking to each other properly, uh, focusing on essentially what is the lesson or the thing that I want them to focus on for that week. Uh, most recently, I had the Overwatch kids uh, I had them watch pro videos, pro highlight videos from a championship series in which I told them that their communications had to be shorter, more specific, and less frequent because it came down to they'd be one-on-ones, two-on-ones, whatever the case may be. They'd be, one -on -ones, two -on -ones, be, they'd be in fights, and there's so many kids yakking or giving details that are extraneous that the player couldn't hear where the other one was coming from. So those kinds of moments, those kinds of meetings, all those things are super important to keep going. Sorry, I moved the spotlight, but I have one part to add. I learned this last week with our supporting women's conversation was one coach also to make the um, players feel more comfortable with failure and with talking with each other is they have to say a hope and a fear for the match when they're in their meetings and then they can address it afterwards if, if they have time. So I thought that was an interesting way to bring in that. That's certainly very interesting, yeah. I'm actually going to go back because I feel like this question that we were asked kind of hits this um, specifically. So uh, it, they asked, my League of Legends team consists of students in various grades and friend groups. What are some ways I can, can promote team unity and chemistry bes besides mandatory meetings, practices, and matches, especially since everyone is still participating in distance learning? So it's hard to build that team feeling 
when everyone is so far apart? Um, so you're, you, you, you would be in this same kind of situation that I would be in. Um, fully remote. Uh, I don't get to meet with the kids. Everything is done over Discord. Everything is remote. Hold on. Yeah, everything is remote. So the only way that I can really think to do anything is that uh, is kind is kind of those practices. Those practices. Uh, all of my students, uh, there at least a bunch of them were all over the place. I had a couple sophomores, a couple seniors, and even the, the seniors I had last year were nowhere near the same kind of people or in the same kinds of friend group that my other sophomores and junior kids were were part of. They were completely different students uh, at, at every at every phase. Um, one thing that kind of brought them together and uh, taught them team, team chemistry was the practices every day. It was the the having to be there on time, the having to be able to uh, to be there a couple times a week, or else they or I would bench them, which is also another thing about punishments. Which is if they don't practice up to a certain amount of times a week, I bench them. I will not let them play. I'll hold them out. I've told them that I will. I would rather forfeit matches on them than have people who don't practice play. That's that's just that's just my mentality. Uh, so it kind of turns into, I think that holding the practices are super important. Having them be there and having them cont uh, constantly play together, I think is super important. The only other thing that I could think to do, especially since they're, again, very different students, very different people, um, I'd say have them get together and play a different game. So like, have them get together, play Warzone, have them get together, play uh, Fall Guys, have them get together, play uh, Among Us. Have them do something that builds some kind of uh, like, you know, communication between them as people. And then the chemistry will begin to build when you put them onto the team, make them play as practice. Yeah, that was going to be mine. He's still mine. Um, we talked about this in another webinar that's very similar to this. And it was like, how do you do this remotely? And, and it was exactly what you said, like building those um, moments where they can kind of get to know each other outside of just being like they're the player beside them virtually. Um, so other games that you can play uh, Among Us was very popular in the suggestions. Jackbox is another one that is more interactive. Um, so that might be one way that you can um, get them to interact. And then I, I like kind of what Rob said was reviewing professional play maybe have a watch party. Many of our, our supported game titles have a pro league as well. So maybe they can have a watch party and have them have some more conversations that are still around this common theme of the esport, but less about like, well, you do this and you do that and building the conversations. No, you're good. So uh, identifying behaviors, especially pertaining to the, uh, to the team. And again, building this team mentality. Uh, it's, it's, not all, it's not all sunshine and farts, right? You, you know, there have, there have to be negatives here. So uh, yelling, at, yelling at the team, uh, insulting a player's performance and sending private messages. The private messages thing is what I touched on before. And that, was, uh, that, that one really crossed the line for me was reaching out privately to a place that I couldn't see or be part of uh, in order to harass a player, which is never gonna be right. And that kid will never be able to convince me that that was uh, a, the right move. The other thing that I experienced in League of Legends since my league team is uh, particularly dramatic and uh, particularly, uh, they, they all belong on r slash I'm 14 and this is deep, uh, is the yelling at the team and insulting a player's performance. So. One of the students that I built the team around to begin with, uh, who was one of our most talented players, uh, now he's not, you know, the most talented person anymore. Uh, he's relatively out of practice and he barely shows up. But part of that came from the fact that he, his, his discipline was so poor as a, as, a, as a person, not as a player, uh, that whenever things wouldn't go right, wouldn't go his way, if he was having a bad game, he'd find a way to yell at the entire team. He would, he would find a way to, uh, to just completely suck the energy out of the room immediately, and uh, he would insult people's performance. Uh, one particular instance I can talk about was he, there, was, there was one instance in a game, I think it was in the fall, where he kept losing his, one, he kept losing his 1v1 in mid. He just, kept, just couldn't, couldn't beat 
like this one guy. So he would lose, his guy would turn and then attack the, uh, and then hit uh, the their mid laner and jungler would gank our uh, our jungler, and then he would complain that our jungler was feeding the other team. It was never his fault. He was either he was either the victim or he was the hero in the story that he wrote about himself. So I had to have many, 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 many private conversations with that student to promote positive thinking, positive speaking, find positive and productive ways to to, uh, to, to deal out criticism to the different players, how to take criticisms better since he was really, really poor at taking criticisms. Uh, when he couldn't, I just, I, I removed him. I removed him for any amount of time that, that needed to be so that he would learn his lesson. And uh, it, it often worked. It, it, it only hasn't worked since he has a job on and off and did ex outside factors that have prevented him from being more included in the team recently. So negative behaviors, you got to identify those behaviors and immediately take action against them. Uh, the I have a follow-up question on that though. Um, when teaching them how to better communicate, do you ever use like sentence starters? This is my elementary teacher coming out. I'm so sorry. 100%. Absolutely. Okay. Teaching them the proper way, again, like I said, how to constructively criticize players. Uh, I always teach them like openings to sentences and things like that, that again, promote positive, that promote positivity, not just an immediate energy vampire way, which is, I noticed that things like that. I noticed that you did this when you could have done that. Could we maybe work on that later? Is this something we could look into in the future? Always make it about we always make yourself part of the process is what I always tell the kids because people are often very sensitive when you want to complain about them. But if you tell them that I will be there to help you take care of this, maybe it's something we could work on. I think this would give us the best chance to win. Sentence beginners, sentence enters, these things all promote positivity and thinking with communication with your team. Awesome, thank you. One more follow-up question. Um, other coaches have talked about having like personal goals and profiles for your players. Do you um, ever use that for players that need like that personal growth side? So for this player that you've had to intervene a few times, did you ever set like personal goals for him? Uh, yeah, more often than not, it was just, I mean, nothing, nothing tangible, nothing physical that I would give him. And uh, at that point, at like last on the fall, he wasn't my student anymore. So there was nothing grade wise or anything I could I could extend to him to, to promote that kind of thing, just more along the lines of, you know, reminding him that if he mastered these things, if he became better himself at communicating, or became better as a player, that it would yield wins and wins. I hate, like I hate to say this, but the one thing just today, just today, I, I promised the students uh, that if they made semifinals, I'd buy all of them uh, a, a donut each from a new place that opened up in Paramus called the Donut Plant. And that if they managed to get, uh, if they managed to win finals, I would get them all half a dozen donuts individually. Uh, the offer has also been thrown out there for if you make certain level of playoffs, I will get you all Korean barbecue, things like that. I mean, I'm super food driven. <laughs> I know that a lot of my students are super food driven. Uh, that's that was always kind of a reward that I that I put up there, and it always. I mean, they all really they all really enjoyed that. I mean, it, it's you know, it's that's it's something tangible, and it also promotes the getting together and building that chemistry as people because it doesn't just happen over the course of you know one independent game. They have to do more than one thing together. Awesome. Yeah. And that brings back to like, kind of like what Jimmy asked earlier about like, how do you build this team feeling? And it, it could be around food, even if they're separate, they could all order, you know, you could order favorite food or have them make their favorite food and just talk about that um, as their I think, award. I think pre COVID we actually had, I paid for out of fundraising money. Uh, we bought a bunch of like pizza hut or Domino's or something as we sat around one day after school, uh, Obviously, I went with whatever the dietary restrictions were for every student. We got a bunch of pies and we sat and we watched one of the championship series and we went over how to get better as players. I mean, this is unfortunately, it's much harder now because of uh, because of COVID for a lot of places who are completely remote, including myself. I know a lot. I, I talked to a lot of coaches who aren't remote and who are in building. And uh, that's terrifying. But, uh, you know, good on them. I hope I hope that I wish them all the ha the healthiness and happiness. But um yeah, it's really difficult when you're remote, uh, but just rest assured that when it gets, when everything becomes a little more normal, 
it is so much easier. And I uh, actually really quickly, just where I got the food thing from was I, I, you know, when I played football in high school, uh, I think it was the Thursday before every game, we always stayed after practice and we went and they had like tons of pasta dishes and they ordered from the Italian places in the, in the area. We all had pasta dinner and then we all watched film and then we went home. And that was, uh, that was a lot of what really brought us together was sitting at, sitting at all the tables with friends, especially friends that we, you know, made, especially on the field. And, you know, I, I, I barely talked to anyone that was in my, that's in my friend group still from those football days, but I'll look back on those memories fondly forever. And that's something that you can use to build is being in the same room, eating food, knowing there's a common enemy tomorrow. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'm from a rural area, so originally, and so we didn't have restaurants. <laughs> so moms from like the booster club or the PTO would bring us like homemade food. I don't know if you, anyone can do that's that awesome. anymore. So similar, we would have um, like food available so that we could, you know, interact with each other. There's just something nice about food. I don't know. Apparently I'm hungry. Um, okay, I'm gonna move us on. So turning individuals into a team, we've hit this a little bit, but any other suggestions for that? Uh, where did where, where we right here? Find teachable moments during practice you can build on, promote practicing with players or in pairs, uh, teach them how to communicate in game effectively depending on the game. So these are all points that throughout the past 15 minutes or so, uh, I've, I've touched on. The teachable moments thing does not only come from a place of punishment and discipline. It obviously also comes from uh, moments that you notice within a game, especially if you're knowledgeable on the game. That's super uh, That's super good. Like That's why I went out and I got an assistant coach for League of Legends. She's not particularly affluent nowadays. She played, uh, she played when the game first came out, but she knows enough about what's going on. So when she watches them play, she knows enough to, uh, to at least talk to me at the end of the game or the kids at the end of the game to talk about what they could have done better, where they slipped up. And she's a teacher and a professional, so she obviously knows uh, how, to, how to communicate with the kids. So finding teachable moments doesn't just have to do with punishments uh, or negative behaviors. A lot of it can also come from uh, critiques that you notice, things that you notice that the kids need to improve on. Uh, promoting practicing with teachers uh, with teams repair so that's obviously also really big sometimes and, and you know what look especially if you're fully remote there are going to be times where sometimes kids don't show up kids don't make it uh, kids have things to do kids have parents who are taking or who are taking them places and they have no control over it sometimes you may not have a full team for practice you'll only have that team for a game it's super important then that you have them do things like pair off if you notice that these two players don't have particularly good chemistry pair them off make them play a couple matchmaking games together promote them practicing together as a team tell them make it look you can practice you can practice with your friends and your other teams another time this one hour in the day you're practicing with the team because you need to get better with these people because while you know clifton and paramus and ordell and river edge why while, while while they might have individually strong football players they can't all just decide they want to be on a team in high school together it's not how it works they have to play within the team constructed from our high schools to get better together so that hopefully they can get noticed by scholarship sponsors and scholarship stuff. So that's obviously the end goal. And then uh, teach team to communicate effectively depending on the game. Uh, like I said, the thing that I've noticed, the thing that's always, I, I find really good, short, punctuated, informative language. And the way they can learn that language is by watching highlights of pros play or just by watching full length championship series, watching all the players communicate with each other what like what have them watch and then practice for at least two days out of your four day week for, for me that's what it is or that's what i set up have them practice those communication skills have them get on and be like all right well you watch tsm do this and say it this way how about you do that and we can run the whole practice based on that and that's what i do and it's been working it's i've my, my teams have only gotten better i have not a single team thankfully that has regressed that's good uh, do you have some favorite teams that you could recommend? You mentioned some TSM. Uh, I, I like TSM. I mean, I feel like if I say Cloud9, it's just going to be, you know, there's some, some front runner nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like Cloud9. I, I, I like I like TSM. Uh, I, I started liking TSM when I when I watched a lot of Hearthstone back in the day. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where, you know, all, all of it comes from for me. I don't, I, you know, I watch Smash a lot and there's, you know, God knows how many different organizations in Smash. So I, if I had to pick one, I'd say TSM. 
Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna say cloud nine. I know. I'm gonna say C9 um, because uh, I hear really good uh, things, comments about the coach and that no matter who his, like, specifically in League of Legends, I don't know about the other teams, but specifically in League of Legends, he has a very good reputation for being a good coach. So even um, no matter like who his team is, like he's changed rosters every season for the past three or four seasons. and they still end up on top. Um, so I, and, and I've heard that from like other people in the scene too. Like he just does a really good job. So if you can listen to a team and maybe get some like sneak peeks into how that coach coaches, and I apologize, I don't remember his name right now. Um, I know, I don't have everything memorized. Um, so that would also help the you as a coach develop some of those coach skills as well. Um, also, if you know anybody, you should you should reach out. Do professional development with other coaches. I, I reached out to my old football coach because I think that the lessons I learned from him as a professional and as a coach, uh, and I'm going to continue meeting with him over the course of the summer. Hopefully, things will be a little better by then, so that I can you know tell him what I've remembered and he can help me to grow as a as a coach because I think that teach them how to communicate more effectively is almost more important than having like teaching them the strategies which we could all learn from watching highlights and you know watching strategic play yeah that's great um or reach out to like the other coaches at your school so maybe you don't have an old coach that you can still reach out to but maybe the football coach or the basketball coach have uh, great suggestions thanks i didn't successful. even think that uh, um hopefully <laughs> where i came from we had an o in 17 seasons so oh yeah or yeah. however many games they didn't win any so uh so moving on from from our previous webinars there might be some that are related that you would like to rewatch. Um, i put the non-judgmental active listening i learned a lot of those sentence starters from this one we had jay from games hotline who has oops sorry who has background in mental health um and getting players to a like healthy mental state. Uh, they went over um, some active listening that you can do. Uh, on the bottom, there's training with a purpose. We had an ath uh, athletic trainer who works with Smite Pro players, talk about how he calms them down when they're kind of heated and had some great um, steps, like the one where like go for a walk, do these certain stretches. Um, so those two are specifically good if you're looking for strategies to calm down a team or a player in the moment. Um, we do have some questions that popped up. Uh, one is how do you get players who don't really want to play motivated to play the game and practice, especially to new players that are just getting started? That's a really good question. Um... I think it kind of comes down to you being able to pair them off with someone uh, that you think is particularly non-confrontational. Maybe they can uh, someone they can use to grow with, uh, or you could put them. Maybe if you have, if you have more than one complete beginner, you put them in 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 a team or uh, or like in a small group setting with a couple of students that you think uh, would be good in a in a mentor role. And especially if you think that they're good in that mentor role, uh, make it make it known to those students that you look at them in that light, because more often than not, if you promote to those students that you feel particularly strongly about them having some kind of a leadership role or a mentor role, uh, they will respond in kind, and they'll become better, and they'll they'll try to uh, to live up to your expectation for them in that role. So when it comes to uh, getting people uh, started or getting uh, players to coordinate with each other, I'd say more often than not, find one of the students in your program in that game that, uh, that you think could be someone who could mentor people and help them to get better and pair them off with them, have them practice independently, have them practice in duos, trios, whatever, or, you know, what have you. Make sure that when, uh, if, if when practice is over, they touch base with that player. Uh, make it so that they have a, uh, some kind of uh, – you know a, oh my god what do they call it oh a point of contact person someone they can refer back to someone that they can learn from etc cetera, etc cetera. if you think that someone's particularly confrontational i would not have them be responsible if you think that person is particularly toxic do not have them do it 
They can be part of it. They can be part of the team, but I wouldn't have them anywhere near uh, the lead role in promoting students getting into the game because that might be exactly the kind of behavior that would drive a new player or someone who's kind of on, you know, kind of a little bit flaky, kind of on the outs. That would be the last person that, that I would have them work with. I'm curious too, like why would a player be unmotivated to play esports? So I would have like a deeper conversation maybe with them too um, about like why they don't want to play the, the games. Maybe it's they're not used to being on a team. And so that part's overwhelming to them. It may be something at home that's going on that's draining them and making them um, unavailable emotionally or mentally for the game. So just having that deeper conversation might help too. Um, and then, yeah, I love the partnering them with um, somebody who can help. Yeah, more often than not, you're gonna find that it's, it's likely things like, uh, like confidence. I had a student who right before I, or right after the first game or right before the first game, whichever one it was for Smash, who a couple of the players reached out to me uh, in, uh, in private messages, letting me know that, hey, this kid's in chat right now and he, he wants to walk, he wants out, he, he's, I, I don't know what to do. I've tried talking to him every which way. So I went in there and it was just a matter of just talking to him. It, it's, he, was, he, was, he was lacking confidence. He, he played one of the other kids 30 times and lost 27 out of those 30 times or it was, tw I'm sorry, 24 times out of those 30 times, to which I was just like, look, I can't beat that kid. <laughs> I'm, I'm better than most of you people, and I can't beat him. So, like, you shouldn't feel bad about it. It, it just, you know, when, when I leveled with him and, and, and kind of instilled this confidence in the fact that, you know, not everyone's going to be as talented as that. And even if, when you continue to use him as a grindstone, someone who's so much better than you, you will become better. So one day when you're able to beat him 13 times out of 30 games, that means you'll be able to destroy other people who aren't on your level now. And it's, it's a matter of, sometimes it's a matter of building confidence. Sometimes you kids just flat out can't play because of uh, parent issues. I've had that too. I've had, I've had whole, I've had tri uh, Fortnite trios had to be disbanded because of one kid whose parents were not on board with them being part of esports, despite the fact that I had a private conversation with those parents and talked to them about all of the positive things that come out of it. And uh, that's just that's just an inevitability. It's something that is going to happen. You will face that at some point. So you should know how to deal with it. Most of the time, it's just a matter of communicating directly with that person. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a question and this is totally um, free question time. It doesn't have to be about building team mentality, even though that was our topic. Uh, this one is one of those questions where they're not on that topic, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, is what are some ideas for fundraising event, events for esports programs? So I'll tell you a little bit about what we did, uh, what we're looking to do, what we're looking to continue doing, and what a couple of the other clubs in the school have done, including some of the teams. So what we did, I did the super easy thing right away, and uh, I noticed that the robotics club was selling individual bags of chips. They buy those like bulk boxes of small bags of chips. And uh, their, their, their turnover, their profit margins were quite good. So what I had, so what I did was I went to Costco or you can go to, if, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to have a place that sells to restaurants, like I've got a restaurant depot nearby. I don't know if that's a chain, I have no idea. But like, you know, go to a good Costco or a wholesaler and uh, buy a bunch of those boxes. I, I had to, fr I, I fronted like 200 bucks of my own money and then I paid myself back after, like after the second or third batch. But uh, one thing that you'll learn is that uh, kids spend their money, uh, they're, they're really piss poor at holding onto their money. So uh, they'll come in and more often than not, they usually have a little bit more than what they need for lunch. And uh, sometimes those kids want a bag of chips in the middle of the day. So not only is it a really good idea for you to have your, your players go around selling individual bags of chips, not during school, not during class hour, but like in between leading right up to right after, it's also good for communication. It's really, really good for advertising for the program too, because it's, you know, uh, when I advertised on, like by putting stuff on the walls or by putting stuff in the morning announcements, not everyone sees that surprisingly. So it kind of came down to, well, uh, that kid's selling uh, Flamin' Hot Cheetos, what club is he selling it for? Oh, eSports, and then that gets around. So it turns into an, uh, an open advertisement as well as, uh, you know, an influx of money for, for my for the program. 
So I went and I figured that I found I figured out that all the kids love like flaming hot Cheetos. So I became the only person to go buy boxes of individual bags of flaming hot Cheeto bags, and my kids were pushing that all over school. So they would do that. They bring back the money, and that was great. Another thing you can do if you want to hold when you know when when normalcy uh, resumes, you can hold individual tournaments and charge like a couple to two to two to five dollars for entrance into the tournament. You can with that money you could do things like offer an amiibo as a prize, offer a, a, you know like a like a like a sandwich, order something. You can get them something small. It's nice. It's part. It's being part of the environment. It's less about the money and more about the environment. And but then also the byproduct is that you get some money. Another thing that I noticed that uh, some of the clubs were doing is the football team had particular uh, particular success with Krispy Kreme. Now, if you don't have a Krispy Kreme near you, you could reach out to a different donut place and see if they want to do something similar. Uh, Krispy, Krispy Kreme did a thing where it was like $10 does, boxes a dozen, and we, you get to keep, I think it's half the money towards the fundraising. So you'd have players go around and they would have like order forms, just like, you know, when we were in high school, with order forms of like, hey, do you want raspberry filled, plain chocolate frosted, whatever. People put down things, get money, give money in. It turned into a lot of work when all the box of donuts showed up, but the football team made like three grand on that. Um, the key club often coordinates with Chipotle. Chipotle will do a thing where if, uh, if they go, if someone goes in and has dinner at that Chipotle or buys from that Chipotle and says, uh, "I'm here to support the uh, the you know the CHS Key Club," uh, a certain amount of money towards that purchase goes to the Key Club. So it turns into a good fundraising thing because it makes money for the club as well as it's good advertising for Chipotle. And no company is ever going to turn down uh, promoting for a school. They'd be foolish to. Uh, you could also go to local restaurants. I know that the diner in, Cl uh, in Clifton very often sends food, if requested, to the school as a way of advertising for themselves, and they are an amazing diner to begin with. Everyone in town knows about them. Uh, continue to reach out to places um, that that do you know eateries in the area. They'll more often than not have something for you. Places that uh, you know new new places might not be the best because they are often strapped for cash. Um, the, uh, the only other thing I can do is there are organizations that work very closely that do social media work uh, in getting donations from people. I can't remember it's the name of the organization. I'm sure I can find it on my phone somewhere. Uh, and I, I could entirely be just New Jersey based, but I know that the soccer club raised like $14,000 through this one organization that literally all they do is fundraise for schools and for programs that reach out to them. They take, I think it was... 23 percent but there's an incentive where they can only take 20 if you hit a certain number so there are organizations that you can likely reach out to within your community that are just dedicated to fundraising reach out to them uh sell individual bags of chips and bottles of water or bottles of gatorade and then also reach out to local eateries because more often than not they will also have ways uh to make some money using them as a as some kind of a catalyst Awesome. I was talking to another super coach the other day about this too, and he sells spots on his stream. So he can have sponsors uh, show up on his stream, um, just like in the little parts. Like uh, we had uh, like billboard type things around our football field and on the like the clock in the basketball gym. So a uh, similar idea, just get a sponsor and you can put their logo, do a little commercial here or there on your stream if you are a streaming group. I don't think I would ever put myself out there for the school because I don't think I could trust the words that would come out of my mouth <laughs> to be representative of the school and make money that way. But you know what, if you're, if you're not a person who curses every three words, I, I more than encourage you to do something that, uh, that promotes your, uh, your program in a positive light like that. Yeah. Yeah, and this was for his team stream, not his personal stream. So maybe that's the difference. I don't know. If I his kids cast it, I think, and do the whole, do the whole thing. Um, I also put a guide in the chat. Oh no, I put it in the answers that we we came up with some ideas, and Eventbrite had a great suggestion list for fundraisers. We're also looking into doing a coach chat about fundraising and budgeting and figuring out um, all of that. We don't have it set yet though, but hopefully soon. 
Um, so I'm going to skip the super off topic question. Um, we'll get back to that one because I do want to answer it and go down to Jimmy's. Uh, they say, I work at a relatively small school, K-12, and while I'm expecting at least two students to join the esports team next year, how do I encourage, convince younger students or students in general to get into League of Legends since the learning curve can be so high? Specifically for League of Legends, I, 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 I tend to think that's, that's, that's a particularly difficult thing. Um, I haven't had much experience getting kids to get into games that they weren't already into. I've been uh, super fortunate enough to just be able to go, we're offering this and kids come in and sign up. Um, if uh, I, I guess the way that I would go about it is that I would openly advertise to the, to the principal and vice, and vice principals and get them to openly advertise at the middle school and let kids know that that is an option, that they can go to high school and play those games. That might be all the incentive they need if they're not particularly uh, physically gifted and they don't wanna play uh, physical sports. Um, they may pick up a game if they think that the, that they're, uh, the opportunity for them to play something uh, at the high school exists. I think that's probably the only way to go about it. Uh, one of the things that I advertise is if they play a certain amount of their starters, or uh, I, I've been saying that if they play a certain amount of games during the season, that they are, uh, they're able to earn a varsity letter uh, through the school. I've already worked that out. So, I mean, if, if the kids, like I said, aren't particularly physically gifted and they like, they don't play football, they don't play basketball, they don't play baseball, so on and so forth. I think that uh, if you just let them know, hey, we have a league team. We don't, you know, we we don't have. You may not be able to play Smash because we don't have this amount of people. Or you can't play Overwatch or that. But we offer this. It might encourage kids who are looking for something to get into to get into that. And then on top of that, I mean, if they just look up League of Legends and they figure out that League still has among the highest grossing uh, prize pools nationally uh, annually at the end of every year, they might be like, all right, well, maybe that'd be worth it. So I'd say, I'd say advertise to the middle schools. Um, I'm gonna add a couple of ideas that were brought up previously too. Um, one was their players who were really into the League of Legends lore made a Pictionary game to make themselves understand the characters better. So they took the ideas of League of Legends and created a game and that brought more kids in because then they got curious about the characters and the champions. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, and then um, my husband randomly made like a D&D &D version of League of Legends because um, he was really into it. So we got to like pick champions and role play and like do the whole battle and now I'm showing off how nerdy we are. Um, no. Same idea makes you really I, I don't play, but I love League of Legends. So it just like builds that like hype behind who the who's in the game and why you would want to play it. So um, I also added like what like having an LCS or LEC like watch party, depending on like your timing, it might be easier to do um, either one. Um, LCS is the North American League of Legends pro organization. LEC is for European. I'm not gonna say which one I think is better, but they're both fun to watch and they are um, very entertaining and they just bring a whole new level to like casting and enjoying watching the game versus like maybe watching somebody in the high school level. And then I would also highly recommend reaching out to local colleges and seeing if they could talk, like have a collegiate player um, come and speak or at least virtually speak with um, interested students. And so hearing somebody that is old enough, that's like cool and they're looking up to, because I remember being a high schooler and be, or a middle schooler and be like, oh my gosh, they're college. They're so old, but cool. Um, so having one of them come and talk might also help drive some um, curiosity about League of Legends. So that leads us to our next question that's completely off topic. What is your favorite team in the LEC? Mine was Fnatic and then Reckless moved and so I, I'm a little lost right now. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, well, there you go. Uh, somebody said always fanatic. I don't know. Brax left, reckless left. Okay. It's too tragic. Tragic. Okay. So now I'm a G2 fan. Um, so, and we also have a game changer. She is the head of content at G2. So I kind of started liking G2 because I get to chat with her every now and then. So um, that's Absolutely. kind of fun. Oh, also, just as a quick note, if you can get girls into your program, if you can get any other people of any variety into your program, get everyone you possibly can. I, For sure. I think bringing in a female uh, assistant coach is what helped to make a couple of the girls who joined my program feel a lot more comfortable about joining my program, which was exactly why I went with her over someone else who also played league because I had a, I had a, I, I had a, you know, friendly relationship with her to begin with, but also I figured that that would help promote it. And it's exactly what it did. Yeah. A hundred percent. Five girls in my program. It's they take, they, they take up a very small number, but I have, I have a bunch of girls and that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, definitely. We talked about last week, like building that community and just having visibility um, in in your esport program or using like we have the game changers you can use um, to promote and then like we have the mentorship program shameless plug um, <laughs> if you have girls in your program already or uh, any other marginalized gender uh, non-binary agender we have an open mentorship program with our game changer ambassadors it's closing soon, so please have them fill it out. We'd love to have them. Um, but just having that visibility, we've been posting about women that are in our Play Versus ecosystem and um, like share it out, get them to look at it, get them to see it. That might help as well with the girls specifically. Um, but always, always just, you know, make it fun sounding and expose them to like different varieties of the games and that will help. And maybe you don't have League of Legends, which is also okay. Um, that's pretty much it for us, unless you have it. We always feel free to visit our help center. We're working on moving it over. So uh, we have the help.playvs.com that you can go join. We have Play Versus Discord where you can ask questions and then always feel free to reach out to support at playvs.com. Next week, we're talking about scouting on um, play versus. So using understanding the terms that you're looking at when you're looking at our scouting pages and then what you can do next with those. Um, and then I'm really excited about this one is college recruitment. We are having three of our co collegiate super coaches come and talk about how for how you as a coach can prepare your players to reach out to colleges and what colleges are looking for um, and like what kind of information do they need. Uh, a, like big spoiler, they look at GPAs and they care about uh, like, like, are they a team player? So this relates to it a lot. Like how can you show that they're a team player and show um, their grades? So very interesting. I've learned a lot talking with them about what college programs are looking for. And then we'll be announcing more topics soon. We'd love to hear feedback, um, just like the questions about fundraising. We base these coach chats off of what everyone asks for. So feel free to reach out. You can post in the events in Discord if you have a specific topic you'd like to learn more about. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, again, I've recorded this, it'll be going out. Um, all of our recordings are now in an unlisted playlist that you can find on the coach chat page. So they're always available for you to find and then we'll send um, this presentation with links. So super exciting, always love to follow up. Any last words, Rob, before I close this out? Oh, I do wanna to touch on one thing. I, I, I've always hammered in the uh, thing. If you don't pass, you don't play. So yeah, going through the GPA thing, still that in the students. They don't pass, they don't play. We're, you know, we're teachers too. You know, we're going to keep that up. Other than that, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope everyone that came in here got exactly what they came for and uh, learned a little bit. And uh, you, you guys can make your program stronger uh, through listening and understanding and reaching out to other coaches. You can always reach me in the coach all chat. Uh, it, it's still Rob Marmotine there too.
Awesome. Yep. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Take care.